Sure, yeah, I've been studying spotted hyenas in East Africa since the late 1980s, and um, I got into it serendipitously where um, a fellow who had been one of my mentors at UC Berkeley uh, suggested that it would be interesting if somebody went out into nature to study social development, and he thought I would be a good person to do that, and I said, wow, I've wanted to do something like that since I was about five years old. Where do I sign? I'm all set. And he said, you just need to write yourself an NSF grant and go do it. And it wasn't that simple, of course, but that's ultimately what happened. Were you already interested in behavior before then, or in the evolution of behavior, or the development of behavior? Yeah, very much. I've been interested in behavior for a very long time, um, and I did my um, PhD work on the behavior of ground squirrels, why ask, addressing the question of why males disperse and females don't. Uh, and I'd been in East Africa as a tourist, and I'd seen a group of hyenas run down a wildebeest and consume it before my eyes, and I remember turning to my husband and saying, I thought these things were supposed to be skulking carrion eaters. What are they doing making an active kill? And he said, yeah, beats me. And then I went home and started reading about them, and they turn out to be extraordinarily good hunters. So you were interested in why males and females within um, a particular species do certain things. You mentioned the ground squirrel. So could you tell us a little bit about how it works in hyenas? How are males and females different and what roles they're playing in, in their social organization? Yeah, the spotted hyena society is very unusual amongst mammalian societies because in most societies, uh, males are bigger and stronger. They've got the weapons that females lack or females have smaller versions of those weapons. And in spotted hyena societies, it's effectively the reverse because females are the bigger, bigger ones and they're socially dominant to the males. And so the males uh, exist at the very bottom of a very rigid linear dominance hierarchy with females at the top and males at the very bottom, and so the males have to basically grovel to get what they want. <laughs> so it's the opposite of what we're used to thinking about in most systems. Exactly. And does that mean that the movement is also different? No. It, interestingly, these, these spotted hyena females uh, represent an interesting mix of sort of traditional female traits and masculinized traits. So they're much more aggressive than males, which is typically a masculine thing, yet it's still the males in spotted hyenas that disperse, as occurs in most mammals. So if you were to go into a hyena population and test all the females, you would see that they were more related to Absolutely. Females are much more closely related to one another than the males are because the males are coming in from multiple surrounding social groups and they, if they're lucky, they become integrated into this group and then they still have to basically cope with the dominant females and their offspring, which are, all, even the tiny offspring are socially dominant to these immigrant males. Females are more closely related to each other in a clan. How is it that you know that? Well, we've been working with these animals since the 1980s, and we've now watched almost eight full generations of hyenas over that 30 years. And uh, we actually have followed the the genealogies of these animals, so we know exactly who's related to whom amongst the females and their offspring, and we can see that um, essentially 100% of males who make it to puberty, in some, at some point during the years after puberty, they leave the natal clan, I suspect because the females that they grew up with aren't interested to mate, mate with them. So in order to have any reproductive success, they need to move to a neighboring group. But the females and their kids um, form these matrilineal kin groups within the larger society, which is called a clan in hyena world, and uh, so the females are unquestionably much more closely related than the males. We've actually looked at the genetic relatedness using microsatellite DNA SNPs, and uh, that's how, that's how the bottom line of how we know that. So you have this weird situation where females are closely related and still living together, they stay in the same clan. Does this kinship actually matter, or how does it matter? 
yeah, kinship's tremendously important in hyena society. Uh, your kin tend to be your closest associates and your best allies. And the animals who are in matrilines that are very small, where for whatever reason, predation or just poor reproductive success, they have few allies, uh, they really have a very hard time if they manage to make a kill maintaining possession of it because any any matriline that's larger can come in and chew them away so it's it's hugely important in just acce accessing resources so females do favor each other that way through very, lines. yeah very much so they're 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 really very most of their uh, altruistic behavior is directed towards kin and in some case other unrelated close associates but their kin are usually their very best and most reliable allies so it's sisters helping sisters Sisters and helping sisters, mothers helping their daughters, daughters helping their mothers, and, and even a little bit further related than that, you find these kin, female kin networks are actually helping one another. Does that have fitness effects? Like, does it really benefit? Have you shown that it benefits those females who are helping each other? Yeah, very much so. Um, I actually have a grad student right now who's actually looked at... Um, unusual circumstances in the dominance hierarchy. Normally it's passed from mothers to their infants. The infants as they grow up inherit ranks immediately below the ranks of their mothers. Um, but he's actually found that every once in a while, in 30 years, there have been uh, about 100 cases of rank reversals where you see an overthrow, a coup d'etat, if you will, of one matriline overtaking another. And the individuals who are able to improve their rank situations are the ones who have strong al network allies. So there is, um, yesterday in your talk, you actually showed a graph that showed the extinction of matrilines over time. Yeah. I believe it was over the entire decades of your studies. Right. Could you describe that graph? Because we're going to use it in, in part of this interview. Okay. Yeah, what, what I was showing was... Um, the fellow who had actually worked with our original study population before I got there, he did his PhD work on that population, and when he went out there, he found a clan that had 19 adult females in it at the time, and he, he had no idea how they were related to one another, because in those days the genetic tools weren't available to, to find that out. Uh, but what he could see very easily from based on their aggressive interactions was who was the highest ranking and then who was the next highest ranking, all the way down to the 19th ranking individual. And then what I show is over the course of three different decades, so from 1979 to 2009, and next year I can do it for four decades, um, you can actually see that the top two females gave rise to what in 2009 were, instead of two out of 19 representatives in this particular uh, high, overall female hierarchy, we see that roughly 60% of the females re represented in the clan are all descended from those two females. So high rank has a fantastic effect on fitness in these animals. And the, the, the gray triangles represent the extinction of entire matrilines over time, so they just wink out. What does it mean to wink out? Just your genetic lineage is no more. Yes, and that's right. And there, there are there are exceptions. There are a couple of middle to mid low ranking females who actually still have from the night from the 1979 who still have descendants available in the clan in that bottom you know 30 40 percent. But nevertheless, everyone else's offspring have eventually. Um, failed to reproduce or been killed uh, for whatever reason, and there are no more descendants of that particular female represented in the clan at all. So that's a fitness of zero. A fitness of zero. It's really dramatic. <laughs> Have you actually been able to show, or is it possible to show, that those females that went from 2, two to 60 percent of the clan in membership were the ones who uh, were high-ranking and who actually helped each other become high-ranking that way? You know, I don't know that Lawrence actually um, maintained um, records on essentially helping behavior amongst those females. We do that today routinely because um, the kin-related nepotism, you know, nepotistic behavior, altruistic behavior is is one of the foci of, of, of our research. But um, we were ultimately able to find out that those top two ranking females were a mother-daughter pair. So because he, when he went out there, he actually marked them by cutting pieces out of their ears. Uh, we decided that wasn't necessary because you can tell them apart so easily by their spots. But because he had that tissue, we could actually determine later on that those animals were in fact a mother daughter, or at least they shared half their genes, basically. So they had an R. An, an R value, exactly. Of .5. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So your group has published a couple papers on, on kinship um, and these effects, these fitness effects of, of helping your kin. 
Uh, so the question becomes like, how do they actually recognize each other? And your group has published on a couple of different possibilities. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. We know that hyenas can identify all their clanmates based on what they look like. We know that they can tell them apart based on how they smell, and also they can recognize individual voices. And we know that they can recognize voices by playing back particular um, recorded vocalizations to them and seeing how they respond to those vocalizations and um, can respond, re respond much more dramatically and forcefully to those playback experiments than do unrelated animals who really just don't bother with <laughs> with the, the, the caller at all. And so we, we know that. We're actually more recently looking at the microbiome similarities in the, in the scent glands among these um, individual members of a matriline to see if there are um, familial relationships within these microbiome communities. And so that should tell us whether they can also use um, these. I, I'd be shocked if they couldn't use scent because they're great. You know, carnivores have this fantastic um, olfactory epithelium and they can do amazing things with their noses that we primates can't, can't even dream of. So we know that they can um, recognize each other um, based on smell because we've put out experiment, we actually collect the scent gland secretion out of the scent glands when we immobilize them. You can actually take a sterile spatula and just scoop some out and put it in a cryotube and freeze it. And so then you can t pull that cryotube back out of the freezer some years later and actually present it on the, you know, hyenas normally deposit their scent gland secretions on an individual grass stalk in the, on the savanna. So we can put out artificial grass stalks and put these alternative scents on the grass stalks and then see to what extent they're, they find these scents interesting. And so quite clearly that they spend differential amounts of time investigating these scents, they're, they're treating them very differently. So we can see that they're, and um, ultimately we know that they can tell them apart that way, but we don't know if it's because of the microbiome yet. So that's where we're working on that. We can sit at the den and watch cubs um, waiting for their moms to come back because they've been all day without their mothers. The mothers go off and sleep in the shade or in the mud someplace cool to uh, get out of the heat during the heat during the middle of the day because we're right at the equator, so it gets quite hot. But the cubs stay at the den all day. They go underground and then typically come out in the late afternoon. And then you can sit around watching these cubs and you know we can see, we're, we've got binoculars, we can see an animal coming from very far downwind and you'll see a whole bunch of cubs get up and look and then everybody else goes, oh, and goes back to sleep. And the, the, the cub of that mother who's coming back to the den, he's very excited. You can just sort of see him quivering with excitement when it sees its mom coming. And there's no olfactory cues, obviously, available at that point because they're coming from downwind. Nevertheless, the cub can recognize her based on just what she looks like from there because she's not vocalizing. She doesn't smell. And so he's got to be able to recognize her by sight. So, um, And they're, all, they're amazingly good because even they can fight together at a kill. And you see sometimes 30, 40 hyenas tearing apart at a carcass and they're all covered with blood and gore. And nevertheless, you know, they're very precise about who they know they can behave aggressively towards and who not. And boy, they very rarely make mistakes. It's really pretty amazing. Yeah, so many senses. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, okay, we already talked about the advantages, so that, that's good. Okay. Um, I wanted to generalize this to finish up a little bit about sort of Two, two questions, I guess. The first is, um, are there any other systems that you know of where kin selection plays such an important role? And do you think maybe kin selection might be underappreciated in other systems? I do. I, I honestly don't know the extent to which it works in non-mammalian species, but certainly it's very widespread in mammals that, that individual mammals can recognize their, their kin based on a number of different sensory cues. And I think it plays a tremendously important role when I studied, I, for my dissertation work, I worked on ground squirrels in California, Sierra Nevada, and their kin very, very clearly helping one another out where they wouldn't help a neighbor on this side who was unrelated to them. And um, and certainly the hyenas are fantastically uh, strongly influenced by kinship. Kinship is really a critical aspect of their sociality. Extending this a little bit further, can you say something about what we know about kin selection in humans and how it's shaped our social society and our social norms? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. In, in a lot of respects, human societies are, are like hyena societies or the societies of many old world primates because instead of social dominance being determined by how big you are or how, how 
strong or large your weapons are, uh, these primates and spotted hyenas and humans have societies where dominance hierarchies are based on conventions. And so in Cercopithecine primates and spotted hyenas, uh, the convention is who your mother is, who her, al her, kin her relatives are, and how well they support her in uh, her efforts to find food and defend food once she's got it and so forth. And in human societies, you see, if you take, for example, Queen Elizabeth in England, she's got, you know, a son, Charles, and he's got uh, two sons, and, uh, you know, there's a, a, a royal hierarchy that you go from the queen down to the lowliest lay people. And so it's very similar in many respects. It's the same sort of convention that's keeping them in place, because Queen Elizabeth can't win a fight against anyone if she was asked to do so physically. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Any questions, Abby? Um, I just had a, a general question about um, hyena behavior. So um, would you want to, do you want to describe some of the behaviors they engage in to kind of recognize kin or to establish bonds or maybe you might want to describe what, like there's the famous hyena laugh. Oh. And what is that for or something like that? Yeah. Or any, any of your favorite hyena behaviors would be really just, great. Just look at Kelly. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask yeah. again, yeah. could yeah. you yeah. describe some of the hyena behaviors and how they establish bonds and maybe what the laugh is about? Sure. Um, hyenas, I think, establish bonds um, outside of their family uh, with um, a very friendly behavior called a greeting ceremony. And when two hyenas come together, uh, the, the most friendly thing they can do to one another is approach and lift a hind leg, and then the other hyena puts its tail end towards that animal's head end, and they each lift their hind leg, and they spend sometimes several minutes sniffing one another's genitalia. And you really need to be trusting of someone sniffing your genitalia who has gigantic teeth and could take your genitalia right off. So um, that's a very trusting, friendly thing to do, and it does seem to um, foster the formation of social bonds. Um, within families, there's um, a, a several different behaviors that, that they engage in that um, they play together, and family members play much more frequently and much much longer and more vigorously than non-family members, for example. So play is a lot of fun to watch in Spotted Hyenas. I can give you some great videotape if you're interested to have some. It's really fun. But um, yeah, the, they engage in a lot of interesting behaviors that actually don't even have anything to do with kinship necessarily. Uh, they're they have a fantastically rich vocal repertoire and uh, the commonest sound that you ever hear in the African night. For those of you who've been lucky enough to be there, you know this, that uh, the hyena's long distance vocalization called a whoop, which sounds something like whoop, and they do that over and over again in a bout. And you can hear this five kilometers away. It's very, uh, very effective long call. But they're called laughing hyenas also because they emit a vocalization called a giggle, which sounds <laughs> like that, like a hysterical human laughter. and. Um, we actually don't understand the function of it. We have thought for many years uh, that it signified, um, okay, okay, I know you're dominant to me, please leave me alone. <laughs> but now we actually, by using a shotgun microphone and directing at the animal who actually uh, was making the vocalization, you can discriminate whether it's the chaser or the chasee who's emitting it. And sometimes it's the aggressor who's, who's emitting the behavior. So that suggests that maybe it's just a general excitement vocalization. We don't understand it, but I've got a student working on that right now. Maybe appeasement, too. It might be. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Listen. I think I have everything I need. Yeah, that was wonderful. Okay, well, if you felt I bumbled through any of that too much, let me know and I'll redo it. <laughs>